God comes from Adam in the day of the Lord. Isaiah 63, verse 1. Who is this coming from Adam with soiled garments from Basra? This one who was stately in his apparel, girded with the greatness of his strength. I speak with righteousness, great to save. Verse 2. Why is your clothing red and your attire like that of one who trod in a wine press? Verse 3. A wine press I trod alone, and from the peoples none was with me, and I trod them with my wrath, and I trampled them with my fury, and their life blood sprinkled on my garments, and all my clothing I soiled. Verse 4, for a day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of my redemption has arrived. Verse 5, and I looked, and there was no one helping, and I was astounded, and there was no one supporting, and my arms saved for me, and my fury that supported me. Verse 6. And I tried peoples with my wrath, and I intoxicated them with my fury, and I brought their power down to the earth. Verse 4 would be the awesome, fearful day of the Lord of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 23. Verses 5 and 6 are if the people of God, the Jewish people, Refuse to heed his prophet, and the purpose of Elijah does not prosper, and God comes with utter destruction to the land. If the Jewish people do not believe in God's righteous servant, they will have their glory hurled to the ground. The glory that comes with the return of God to his temple on his holy Mount Zion. When God says, I trample peoples in my anger, he does not do it in his power. He raises up armies against Israel. And he does not do that in his power. The armies are always there. And when he speaks to his prophet and is not heeded, those armies come and destroy, they always have. God uses himself in the first person of the scripture often. When he says, I will bring utter destruction, he means my creation will bring utter destruction. The armies will bring utter destruction. God is his creation. That he can do it in his power simply makes, it, makes the destruction seem more assured of happening. To instill fear of him in his people if his prophet is not listened to and heeded. The teaching of possible utter destruction when God returns with his messenger Elijah and the angel of the covenant that you desire in the day of the Lord does not fit into the sages and rabbis era of restoration, redemption, and exaltation, the Messianic age, of the Jewish people with peace throughout the world, Judaism as the only religion, and Hebrew the only language. If Elisha's purpose fails, utter destruction to the land occurs as it once did by the Assyrians to the northern kingdom, and by the Babylonians to the southern kingdom, and then all of Israel by the Romans. Today it would be Islam. The day of the Lord begins when the lands of Abraham bloom again after years and years of desolation. And the ruined cities in Jerusalem are rebuilt by the Roman dispersal. When this happens, the time to come for the new covenant has arrived. And that time is today. The land blooms again, and it began in 1948 when the state of Israel was created. It's very simple. God is saying, 
in Isaiah, when you come back, I'll come back. And he comes with two covenants. Covenant of friendship, which is in two parts, and the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. A covenant of written sin forgiveness that causes Torah to be written on the heart of the Jewish people, and all the Jewish people shall heed him. In Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 14, Ezekiel says, A spirit seized me and carried me away. I went in bitterness and the fury of my spirit, while the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Ezekiel was not crushed with disease and did not offer himself for guilt. God just seized him and he was punished just as the righteous servant is in Isaiah 53 to make him suitable for God's purpose and to be one of God's prophets. He was punished with maltreatment, crushed to the ground with bruising in the course of God's power for 390 days on his left side for the punishment for their sins of the house of Israel and 40 days on his right side for the punishment of the house of Judah for their sins with God's chastisement upon him. God explains the purpose of this treatment. But the house of Israel will refuse to listen to you for they refuse to listen to me. For the whole house of Israel are brazen of forehead and stubborn of heart. But I will make your face as hard as theirs and your forehead as brazen as theirs. I will make your forehead like adamant, shamir, harder than flint. Do not fear them, and do not be dismayed by them, though they are a rebellious breed. That's Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. How will God make Ezekiel, Ezekiel suitable for his purpose, making him as hard and brazen as the houses of Israel and Judah? Remove his fear of them and his dismay when they shun him and do not listen to him. Just as with the verses of Isaiah 53, verse 3, Ezekiel was shunned, held of no account, and laughed at, according to Rashi's interpretations. By punishment, chastisement, maltreatment, crushing, and bruising, in the power and words of God, like a boot camp, for a cadet marine or breaking a wild horse, removing his bitterness and the fury of his spirit. It took God at least 430 days to make Ezekiel suitable to be a prophet to the Assyrian Babylonian exiles while he was cut off from the land of the living, confined to his house in the courts of God's power, which is part of Isaiah 53. And taught, uh, and taught the words God would have him speak to the exiles from the scripture. God's righteous servant is a Gentile from a Christian country who has to go to a strange country of a foreign language and be taught Hebrew and Judaism to make the many righteous. The Talmud says and associates a saw with a dom and Esau Adam with Rome, then Christian Rome, and today Christianity. And that's where he's coming from. And he wasn't allowed to pass through Adam in the Exodus. Adam wouldn't let uh, the Israelites, Moses, and God and his angel pass through. God will be in this Christian country for a long time making his righteous servant suitable for his purpose with punishment, chastisement, maltreatment, crushing, and bruising, a purpose that might prosper. Ramban was correct in chapter 12, paragraph 2, of the laws concerning King Moshiach as to the arrival of the anointed one before or after Elijah when he says, all these and similar matters cannot be clearly known by man until they occur. For they are undefined in the words of the prophets. 
It is the arrival of God's righteous servant that Judaism should have been concerned with all along, and in particular, his role as Elijah, who doesn't have a description, but he's in Malachi, Malachi uh, 3, and he has the same purpose. He's not the, one, the man described as Elijah of the Bible, but his purpose is the same. Make the many righteous, bring the Jewish families back together, one to the other, being mindful of the teachings God gave Moses, of his laws and commandments for all of Israel. And that follows with Elijah. But no description. But it's the same, and, and it's a purpose that might prosper. If he's not successful, God comes with utter destruction to the land. Isaiah 53, God, God has a purpose that might prosper that's not specified. It, it's to return to a temple we find in Malachi 3, verse 1. And it might prosper. It's, you know, so the purpose of the righteous servant is the same as the purpose of Elijah. Teaching that Isaiah 53 is the Jewish people prevents this in God's righteous servant. And in particular, in his role as Elijah. Such a teaching could result in utter destruction to the land. If Elijah is not recognized by description and is not believed, he cannot recounsel the Jewish families one to the other through practicing Judaism, clearing the way for the Lord. Elijah's purpose will not prosper, and when the Lord comes, it will be with utter destruction to the land of Israel. There's approximately uh, 7 million Israeli Jews today. A bell should chime, never forget when you hear those kind of numbers. And this is God's words. But it's not part of the Messianic era. Rambam says Moshiach will compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah. Perfect the entire world, motivating all the nations to serve God together. There will be neither famine nor war, neither envy nor competition. The entire world will be solely to know God. And the Jews will, therefore, be great sages and know the hidden matters with an understanding of their creator to the full extent of human potential. This does not account for the reality of the world in <clears throat> commentating on the scripture. When reality is displaced for poetic words and songs of God and his prophets, often meant for hope and joy at such a thought, as the persecution of the Jews ending, the practicalities of the real world, and the purposes of God's righteous servant, the prophet like Moses, David, and Elijah, in the clear words of God in the scripture, are lost. One man cannot compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah or perfect the entire world and the sages were wrong in their interpretation of these matters. You know, where, where, where's God's vindication against the Gentiles? Where is that? I mean, we see it in chapter 51 of Isaiah. I'm taking my wrath, the cup of my wrath, my bowl of reeling from you, my people, and I'm passing it to those that told you to get down on the ground and walked all over you. Well, he's going to do that in his day, his day of redemption, which is the first of Isaiah 63, those first six verses I read where he comes from Adam, a Christian country. And Elijah himself is a Gentile. He's a Tishbite, an inhabitant, an inhabitant of Ramoth Gilead, which is a territory like Adam, east of the River Jordan. And when he's taken up by God to heaven, he's in Gentile land. He crossed over the Jordan into Gentile land. It'd be Jordan today, the country of Jordan. And he's returned to as a Gentile. And God's coming from a Christian country. And of the peoples, none are with him, is in those first six verses. That's the Jewish people. There's no Jews coming with him. And he's coming from a Christian country. He's coming with a new covenant to be delivered by his messenger, Elijah, or Moses, the prophet like Moses, who gave the Jewish people the first covenant. Moses, God had to have a guy. 
In the day of the Lord, a new covenant is coming. It's an amendment to that first one. He's got to have another Moses. It's all so simple. Compel all of Israel to walk on the way of Torah or perfect the entire world. I, I just, you know, it's an impossibility. Something can be done. You have to ask yourself, okay, well, that's not going to happen. God doesn't work like that. This world's not going to change like that. What is there? Well, you have to read these covenants of friendship. And quite frankly, do the Jewish people want the entire world to be a Jew? Do you want four, uh, uh, two billion Christians and two billion Muslims converting to Judaism? I mean, right there you're looking at somewhat like four billion to four on voting matters at synagogue. And in the words of Rambam, one should not entertain the notion that the King Moshiach must work miracles and wonders and bring about new phenomena within the world, resurrect the dead, or perform other similar deeds. This is definitely not true. Compelling all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah would be phenomena, miracle, and wonder. Perfecting the world would be beyond that. He says, this is going to happen, but it can't happen this way. It can't happen by miracles. What would we got? I don't, you see, in his world, that's possible. That's why the rabbis today who are stuck in antiquity, in the dark ages, and they just go with whatever the interpretations were back then. Well, back then, Rambam could have a point. It, it, his world was small enough and knowledge was small enough that, that this made sense. But not today. Not today. There's billions of people on this planet. But that's what the rabbis teach today. As Rambam said in the laws concerning King Moshe, chapter 12, paragraph 4, if a king will arise from the house of David, who delves deeply into the study of the Torah and, like David his ancestor, observes its mitzvahs as prescribed by the written law and the oral law, if he will compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah and repair the breaches in its observance, and if he will fight the war wars of God, we may, with assurance, consider him Moshe. If he succeeds in the above, builds the Mikdash, the temple, on its site and gathers in the dispersed remnant of Israel, he is definitely the Moshiach. He will then perfect the entire world, motivating all the nations to serve God together. And it is written, Zephaniah 3.9, I will make the people's pure speech so that they will all call upon the name of God and serve him with one purpose. The problem, the problem is this. Rambam interpreted that, and how he did that, I don't know, as being all the peoples of the earth. Well, it's not. Go read the verse before it. Talk about cherry-picking because you wanted to say a particular thing. No, it's the Jewish people, and they do. I mean, we're talking about the land of Israel. Well, when they created Israel in 48, they adopted Hebrew and Arabic as their language. They speak a pure language. This is a true statement from Zephaniah. It's a true prophecy. But the world, and from, and from the world speaking Hebrew, you get the world believing the Jews are right about God. You get the world exalting, exalting and converting to Judaism. It's just wrong. You know, it's not so much that he was wrong in his time. It's just, it doesn't work now. I mean, he was wrong. But there's an understandability to it. Today, there's not. There, there, you know, anybody that reads and thinks the entire world's going to speak Hebrew is just, you know, they need to step outside the box for a little bit. The last paragraph by Rambam is a good example of misreading a verse of scripture and then giving it a meaning never intended, and it becomes common and infallible belief among the rabbis, 
and then those they teach. And it is, it is an example of poetic words and songs of God and his prophets, often met for hope and joy at such a thought as the persecution of the Jews ending, being construed as something they are not, and applied to the reality of the world. Here's what Zephaniah 8 says. This is right before 9 where he says, I'm going to make the people of a pure speech. This is the Lord. But wait for me, says the Lord, for the day when I arise as an accuser. Okay, that's the day of the Lord. When I decide to gather nations, to bring kingdoms together, to pour out my indignation on them, all my blazing anger, indeed by the fire of my passion, all the earth shall be consumed. Now how is that perfecting the nations? How is that bringing peace and harmony among, among all the countries and peoples of the world? That Moshiach, he's not even Moshiach according to Rambam if that's not done. And that is still taught today. God has tested the world with the Jewish people and the world failed. The fire of my passion is God's anger at the world and his love of the Jewish people in one metaphor and the earth being consumed is a poetic way of saying the world will have no meaning to him or his people in the day of the Lord, the Gentiles. The world simply will never invoke the Lord as Hashem and serve the God of Israel in one accord. Two billion or so Christians and two billion or so Muslims are not going to wake up one morning and in one accord speak Hebrew and denounce their false gods. Okay, and then I had, there's the covenant of friendship, and it's in two parts. It's in Ezekiel 34. I'm getting to it slowly, but sure, it's very long. And it really has a lot to do with the land blooming again. And so he came in early to, to prepare the righteous servant to be suitable for his purpose. And at the same time, the land's blooming again. Israel has returned, if you read all the different verses in it. And that's Ezekiel 34, verses 23 through 31. And then in chapter 37, you have the, uh, the rest of the friendship covenant, which is also very interesting and includes placing his sanctuary back, back amongst his people. So he knows it's not there. And he knew it when he had this written in the Hebrew Bible. That's... Uh, Chapter 37, verse 24 through 28 of Ezekiel. I think that just about does it. One last thing. The day of the Lord is to complete and fulfill the remaining prophecies of the Hebrew Bible, deliver two specific covenants, build the third temple, and God will have his vengeance for vindication against the enemies of the Jewish people. The Jewish people will never be overthrown and uprooted again, will no longer bear the taunts of nations, and will rest secure in a time of peace. All prophecies fulfilled by one man, who is God's representation, who brings before the Jewish people, by his actions and words, the will of God in the day of the Lord as Moses did in the Exodus to the promised land. He is God's righteous servant, his messenger of the new covenant and recounselor of Jewish families, Elijah. He is the anointed one, the shepherd God calls my servant David and his veritable mouthpiece on earth and writer of his words, the prophet like Moses. That's what they say about Moses, that he spoke to God face to face and his one friend 
to another friend. And I'm going to talk about that on another video. Thank you very much.